Good morning. Welcome to Green Hills Christian Fellowship. We are a church who desire to know Christ and make him known. We desire to know Christ because he loves us and we love him. We desire to make him known because we share the love we receive and we love God's people. Today is Communion Sunday where we will commemorate the Lord's Supper. We will remember him who loves us with such great love that he would die on the cross for our sin. We will remember Jesus who promised that those who believe in him will join him in that joyful supper one day in heaven where he will once more drink of the fruit of the vine. How pleasant is it when God's people come together in unity to worship him. You and I are in the best place where we can be right now, in the presence of the exalted God Almighty, whom we magnify. The psalmist invites us, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let us pray. Oh God, eternal, the God of the ages, we worship you. O oh Father, creator of the universe, the giver of life, you are the holy and righteous one. The psalmist asks, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart? We come before you, our Father, dressed only in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember how sinful we are. And yet you have said in your word, you will cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. You will wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Thank you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus who cleanses us from our sins. That you, Lord, remember our sin no more. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he, have you removed our transgressions from us. We worship you, our Lord Jesus. You are our Savior. You are the Alpha and the Omega who holds everything together. You, the image of the invisible God, have shown the Father to us. O oh Lord, in these truths and convinced by the Spirit, we stand worshiping you, our Almighty Father. We lift your name high. There is no one like you. Who can compare to you, our almighty one? Help us. Help us, O oh Lord, to magnify you, our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come. Come and draw near to him and praise our God in glad adoration. Let us exalt him together. Amen. Let's stand together, church. Sing praise to the Lord. Sing praise to the Almighty God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. We sing. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for Him. Right. 
Indeed, we are here to praise you and only you, O Lord, our Lord, to acknowledge that you are God, to give thanks to you, our maker, our master. May you be honored, for we honor you this morning. Who 
glorified as we continue to worship you. We can take our seats.
Luke writes, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. As we give our tithes and offering, let us remember that God owns everything and he doesn't really need anything from human hands. Let us pray for the offering. Our Father in heaven, our gracious and generous God, the one who provides for everything we need. Thank you. Thank you that we have everything we need, really. You have said that if we have food and clothing, we can be content. And we have more than that. You have given us Jesus. You have given us salvation. You have given us eternal life. Father, it is with great gratitude and with a spirit of worship that we give you back a portion of what you have given us. Help us to worship you with this giving. Help us to use what we have given for the furtherance of your kingdom. And Lord, as we give, I pray that always God will be glorified and your people will be built up. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is faithful. He allowed me to remember the microphone. The Lord is faithful. He is true to his word. His words are true. So let us stand up now as we look at his words in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 25. John chapter 21, verses 15 to 25. We stand up because we honor God's word. Let us read. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than this? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this rumor, because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. May the words of God bless you and may the preaching of our senior pastor bless your hearts. Let's be seated. Good morning, beloved. Three years ago, I had the special joy of presenting before you one of our pastoral apprentices. Well, he equipped himself, went to Singapore Bible College, graduated with a Master's of Divinity. And I am so glad to tell you this pastoral apprentice, who just used to sit there among you, is now one of our full-time pastors. I'm going to call up here our full-time pastor, Pastor Parkin Young. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Uh, did you notice our pastors keep getting younger? That means, brothers, I keep getting older. So I requested his parents to stand up where they are seated. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Young, could you please stand up? Elder Peter is one of our elders at DCF Northwest. I wanted them to be honored because, beloved, it takes two good parents to raise a pastor's son. And they have every right to give glory to God, just like you have now. I'm going to request you now, as I pray for him and welcome him to the full-time pastoral staff, to join me in praying. And with no compulsion on your part, if it's in your heart, will you raise your right hand towards him as I pray for him and welcome him as part of our pastors? Let us pray. Father, thank you that in your sovereign plan you would call Parkin Young, put it in his heart, Lord, to be equipped for the ministry. And then, Lord, instead of leading them ha him down a path that would have made him a, an international pilot, Lord, or perhaps inherit his father's business, you called him to be your pastor. And now he's at this threshold of his life to stand before your flock and be commissioned in prayer by the very same flock 
that he will serve. We thank you, Lord, for his life, but we glorify you for your call. We thank you for his parents who are responsible for what he has become, how they have supported him, prayed for him, rooted for him, cheered him on during the hard times of his education, and are now standing before you, not to be exalted, but to give glory to you for giving them a son like Parkin Young. Father, Parkin will go through a lot of things in the ministry. He will realize it is never easy, Lord. And there will be times the ministry will break his heart. I pray that during those times you will make him grow faster than he could ever have grown if you had not broken his heart. May you always give him joy in the midst of the blessings of ministry, but especially so in the midst of the trials of ministry. And may you make him realize, Lord, at the end of all of these, that you are pleased with him for responding to your call. May his life serve as an inspiration, Lord, to those you've given other callings, because, Lord, even as they stay where they are, they are just equally called like him. You just simply gave him a full-time calling in the pastorate. But, Lord, let the engineers, scientists, doctors, teachers, whatever their professions are in this congregation, in the same way, be inspired to use their professions, their businesses for the glory of your name. May his life, Lord, may his words both give glory and honor to you. Because we ask this as a church family and we ask this all in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Parkin Young. Welcome. Praise God. Wow. What a great way to start our service. Beloved, could you open your Bibles with me to uh, John 21, 15 to 25, the one we, we just read together. And this is actually connected to what you just saw. I, I want to correct something that's probably in your minds. A missions month did not end last Sunday. I know that was supposed to be the schedule. But you also know we go through a series in the book of John that happens to be uh, the communion series, but... Well, again, by God's timing, this is about mission. In fact, the very last story in the book of John by which we close the series is about being recalled to mission. It's about a second chance to serve. It's about the heart of why we even serve the Lord. Why are we even in church? Why do we even say we're believers? This is what it will be about, beloved. This is so basic, and it is so relevant. You see, we are now living in the age of what they call the age of the selfie. The selfie age, you know, the age where people are so morbidly interested in themselves. And so I was researching, uh, is there any data or statistics on what happens to people who take selfies? Uh, so listen to this. In the first half of 2017, this is the latest I could get, first six months, uh, it is said that uh, 29 people died while taking selfies. Did you, one of them is from the Philippines, by the way, out of those 29. Uh, uh, in the first, in the same six months of 2017, you know how many died from shark attacks? Five. So, it is literally six times more dangerous to be taking selfies than swimming in the oceans of the Philippines. So, please do not take selfies while swimming in the ocean of the Philippines. Probably more dangerous. But somebody wisely observed that the selfie age has twisted the command of Jesus. Remember his command, love your neighbor as yourself. And the selfie age has twisted this to become, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a sad truth. Our passage today brings us back to the most basic of all loves. It's not self, and neither is it self. It's the Lord. And that's what we would like to look at today. Will you join me in a quick word of prayer this time for our message? Father, I pray that this devotion, this reflection on John 21, the last incident, will prepare our hearts, Father, for the Lord's table where we will gather together and be reminded this is what I have done for you. The Lord Jesus telling us through the elements today, this is what I've done for you. My body broken for you. My blood shed for your sins. 
remind us today both through this account in the Word and, Lord, even to the Lord's table, that we who have been forgiven much should love much, Father. We who continue to be loved today and will always be loved until eternity should respond back in love to the one who loves us even though we do not deserve it, Lord. Change us through your word. I pray this will never be an academic study, Lord. Something for the head. I pray it changes us. It transforms us. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, beloved, Missions Month isn't over. It continues today. And we close the communion series. Uh, We'll have a new one in September. But even as we do that, I'd like you to realize this incident here that we'll study is where Jesus, Peter, and John figure prominently. It reveals much about them, but it also reveals a lot about our hearts. Beloved, this is a message for believers. This is not going to be an evangelistic message. This is a family message, an in-house message. And there are two kinds of believers sitting here in this congregation right now. You're one of them. One, those who are very actively serving the Lord with everything they have. The second one are those not serving the Lord. Now, the second one has two other categories. Those not serving the Lord are of two kinds. One, you want to. You haven't started yet. Then I pray that the passage today will remind you, go ahead and start. Those actively serving may remind you, keep serving on. But I told you there's another category of those not serving. These are the people who used to serve. They used to be on fire. They used to be passionate about serving God. But something happened along the way. Maybe somebody broke their heart. Maybe they stumbled because of somebody, some leader, some other member in church. Or some other church. Or maybe they broke their own hearts. They fell into sin. And they have repented of that sin. But they cannot bring themselves to serve the Lord again with the same fire, with the same passion. It's like God has written me off. I'd like you to know. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is no basis for that idea anywhere in the Bible. And the story you will look at today is one of the most beautiful in the Bible. We love Peter because we see ourselves in him. The fact that he was restored by the Lord despite his denial of the Lord gives hope to all of us who sometimes think or ask, Is God done with me? Will he even have anything to do with me after everything I've done? And it may not be public. It may just be you saying you're disqualified. Or it could be the whole world saying we don't expect you to serve again. Beloved, there are believers who think they've fallen by the wayside. Learn this from the reinstatement of Peter. No matter how far you fall, God gives repentant Christians a second chance. And the only thing he looks for is genuine love for him. A love we prove by loving others. The first thing we learn in the passage is that the most important expectation of Jesus from every believer is simply to love him. The most important expectation of Jesus from you, from me, is just to love him. And I will emphasize this is just from believers. It cannot be, I'm sad to tell you this, but it cannot be that an unsaved person will now say, well, I love the Lord Jesus. Some of you might even say, I know somebody who who is not definitely a Christian, but he says, I love the Lord Jesus. In fact, I once heard preaching some time ago that actually said this. You know, all you need to do is tell Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you, Jesus, and you'll be saved. May I say this with sensitivity, and yet I hope without any apology? That's a heresy. That will lead you straight to hell. You cannot say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now save me. That's not how it works. The Bible is very consistent. We come to the kingdom of God through repentance. We have to see that we have offended a holy God. And we first ask forgiveness. 
Now that will make us turn to the only source of forgiveness, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we will say, Lord Jesus, because I cannot save myself, because religion cannot save me, because GCF cannot save me. Lord Jesus, save me based on what you did. You died for me. I believe. Some of you said, I trust. Some of you said, I accept, I receive. They mean the same thing. When with the simple faith of a child, you just trust in Christ and only Him, God recognizes that He saves you. Then and only then will God give you a heart that could rightly say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Until that time, you cannot, I cannot say, I love you. But once you are a Christian, may I emphasize, the most important expectation of Jesus from every Christian is just to love him. Now let's go through the story. Is this the first time they met? No. Look at John 21, 14, the verse before 15. It says, this is now the third time. Every single time Peter was there. The first two times were probably in the room where they had the Lord's Supper because they were meeting there. Do you remember that? And most Bible scholars tell us it's quite implied from the account that in the, those first two times, Peter asked forgiveness. In other words, Peter had repented. It's not stated in the Bible, but it's implied that Peter had already repented, asked forgiveness from the Lord. Beloved, the problem in our passage is not that Peter is not repentant. He is reluctant to go back to serving the Lord. How do you know that? Why do you say that? Look at John 21, verse 3. It's also in the same chapter. Uh, John 21, 3. Do you remember what Peter said when he took this up last July? He said, I go back fishing. And the other disciples said, I've joined you. Beloved, unless we remember how God called P Peter to Jesus, it doesn't seem shocking. You see, three and a half years before this, Peter was fishing, and Jesus called him and said, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He left his fishing profession. He never returned. But now he says, I go fishing. You know what the equivalent is? It's like me standing before you today, and then I will tell you, uh, GCF, uh, I go back to being a doctor. Yeah? I make more money. I have more prestige. I have less problems. Of course you'll be shocked. Say, oh, why, pastor? That's the equivalent here. That's what tells us Peter was reluctant to go back. He had repented, but he was reluctant to go back. And there are people like that. And you might be sitting here exactly like that. I'm sorry, Lord. I failed you. Forgive me. You know what? If you meant it, if that, if that was from your heart, the first time you said it, God said, Done. Forgiven, forgotten. But many of us, we carry on for years. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Take me back. And God said, you've told me a hundred times. Come back. That's Peter. Repentant, beloved. But reluctant to go back. So verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, do you truly love me more than this? Again. Verse 16, Jesus said, Simon, do you truly love me? Third time, verse 17. The third time, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus questioned Peter three times about his love to remind him that he denied Jesus three times. What is Jesus trying to do? He's trying to tell him. There is no real restoration without realizing how you felt. And God sometimes does it this way, beloved, so that we will not go back to the same path again and again. Notice first his very first question. It's comparative. Peter, do you love me more than these? Uh, who are the these? Is it the fishing boat, the fishing net, the fishing profession, the 153 fish they caught? I don't think so. Uh, I know you, if you like to read the uh, commentaries. I know we have seminary students here. Some of them say that. I do not agree with that. I rather take the opinion that these refers to the other disciples. Why, pastor? Because in Matthew 26, 33, in the upper room where they had the first Lord's Supper, Peter boasted the following way. Let me read it for you. Matthew 26, 33. Even if all 
fall away because of you, I never will. You know what that means? Uh, Peter is not talking about the whole of Israel. He's not talking about the people outside. He's talking about the 11. He's actually telling Jesus, uh, Lord, if these 11 guys uh, fail you, not me. And do you love me more than these was a subtle reminder of that boast. How did Peter answer? He refused to compare himself anymore. What does that tell you? This is a very broken man. He now refuses to compare himself with anybody. The man who had been so boastful, so sure of himself, is now completely broken. He needed to see the enormity of what he had done. He needed to hear Jesus ask this painful question so he could grasp the greatness of the forgiveness he had been given. Only then could he be restored. Without the pain, he could not get better. As painful as it was, it was absolutely necessary. Jesus is like a good surgeon cleaning an infected wound. He has to remove the, the infected tissue, the necrotic tissue. And so it's a painful process, beloved, but he has to do it. You see, once we hurt someone we love, it's hard to look them in the face and even harder to be questioned about our commitment. But the point is Jesus doesn't settle for quick superficial answers. That's Jesus. He has a way of getting to the heart of the matter, which is always a matter of the heart. How does he do it? How would you respond? If Jesus asks you, do you love me? Do you truly love me? Am I even your friend? What will we say? And that is what he asked Peter. The questions must be asked. The answers must be given. And they must be repeated if the truth is to be fully known. Somebody once said the truth will set you free, but sometimes it has to hurt you first. Did it hurt Peter very much? Look at our Bibles again. When Christ asked Peter the third time, it says he was deeply hurt. And what did he say? He blurted out, Lord, you know all things. What was Peter trying to say? Lord, I don't even know my heart. I don't believe in myself anymore. This is Peter saying, I just renounce all my confidence in myself. And I give up. Beloved, when you reach that point, that is a crucial step in Christian growth. You grow spiritually the day you say with conviction, my trust is in the Lord. I no longer trust myself. And that is difficult for a congregation like ours. I will call a spade a spade. Most of you are very, very successful people. That's how our church was founded. We cannot change that. We praise God for that. But sometimes we are very self-sufficient. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this. The moment you say, Lord, I will believe in you. I will trust in you. I will put my confidence in you, not in myself. You grow spiritually. Sometimes, like Peter, we have to hit rock bottom hard to learn to say, my trust is in the Lord and in the Lord alone. By the way, did it work? Did the painful surgery of the greatest doctor in the universe work? Absolutely. Just a few weeks later, the very same Peter would stand on the day of Pentecost before the very same people who crucified Jesus. How do you know that? Because Acts 2.20 says, he told them, you crucified him. So he was standing before the same people. Not only who crucified Jesus, he was standing before the same people before whom he lost his nerve. Remember why he denied Jesus? He lost his nerve. And he denied he ever knew Jesus. He would stand before them on the day of Pentecost, preach a gospel sermon, prick them to their heart. And that day, 3,000 were added to the church, baptized. And those 3,000 would become the founding members of the early church movement. And the world has never been the same again. Did it work? It worked spectacularly, beloved. But pastor, I want to know this. Why is the most important expectation of Jesus from me, from you, to love him? 
If you have your Bibles, will you please open them with me to 1 Corinthians 13? Let's just look at the first three verses together. I will paraphrase those verses for you. I may be the world's most eloquent speaker, but if I don't love Jesus, I'm just a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. I can have impressive spiritual gifts and great theological knowledge and faith that can move mountains. But if I don't love Jesus, it's all nothing. I can give away all my money, even suffer martyrdom. But if it was done without love for Jesus, it profits me nothing, beloved, because love for Jesus is the most important motive for all we do for Him. It is what characterizes a true believer. Pastor, how do I learn to love Jesus? I will now bring you to another story in the Bible. Something I love to use. In Luke chapter 7, there was a gathering in the house of a Pharisee. His name was Simon the Pharisee. Sometimes they invited Jesus for different reasons. We now realize this one, probably not for the right reasons. The Pharisees were always looking for a way to trap Jesus. For some reason, Jesus ends up in the house of people who didn't like him. Simon the Pharisee and his other Pharisee friends. And in comes what is described as sinful woman. We know from verbal tradition, the sinful woman here is one of two kinds. She's either a very sexually immoral woman, and the whole community knows that, or she is a prostitute by profession. But either way, in their culture, in their system of beliefs, if a sexually immoral woman, especially a prostitute, steps into your home, your whole house is defiled. And so Simon was probably very upset with this lady. But she doesn't stop there. She takes an alabaster jar. And we know from a study of, of Israel's culture and history, this often represented her inheritance. That's where they invested it. It was a preparation for their future wedding. It was a major part of everything she would own for life. She broke it. She anointed Jesus with her life-saving, beloved, and then wet his feet with her tears. And Simon the Pharisee is even more upset. He says, if this Jesus is as good as he claims to be, if he's really a man of God, a prophet, he will know. He's now defiled by that woman. And now if you look at Luke seven forty-seven, it says there, Jesus said, she loved much Simon because she had been forgiven much. You know what that means? It's all past tense in the Greek, by the way. This woman has repented of her sins. It means before this encounter. We don't know how, we don't know when, but this woman came to repent of her lifestyle and put her faith in Christ. She had been forgiven much. So Jesus said, she had been forgiven much, therefore she loved much. But Simon, one who is forgiven little, loves little. It was a slur on Simon. It was Jesus telling Simon and the other self-righteous Pharisees, you see no need for forgiveness from me, so you do not love me. Because he who is forgiven little, loves little. How do I learn, how do you learn to love the Lord? That's why we have the communion. That's why we do this. The communion, beloved, is to remind us, me, you, you have been forgiven much. Now you love much. Not only that, you aren't just loved past tense. You are loved and will always be loved eternally. Beloved, the communion brings us back to God. It reminds us of the cross, but it also reminds us of the continuing and perpetual and eternal love of the Lord for us. Sometimes, because I've been there with you for a long time before I became your pastor, I've even thought this. Sometimes when I hear a Pastors speak like that. I will ask, you don't know what I've been through. If you only know what I've been through, you will not say that God has been good to me. I have so many problems in life, but let me ask you a question then. If you think like that, are you in the ICU right now? I don't see any IV lines. Anyone here has an IV? 
The fact that you're here in good health means if you think you have a lot of problems, aren't you glad you're still in good health right now? Just before the service, I met one of the, I will not mention her name because I forgot to ask her permission. We prayed for her a lot because she almost lost her life in the IC of Cardinal after an operation called a cystectomy. And I saw her and I said, do you remember that we even visited you? And of course, she was very groggy. But just to see her, beloved, among us worshiping us again, this reminds us. You might have great problems today, but you're still healthy enough to be here. Beloved, please don't let me stretch the argument further. I hope you believe with me. Whether you feel it or not, we are very deeply loved right now. We have been forgiven much. We are loved right now. We will always be loved. Therefore, that's why we love the Lord. But... We continue, beloved, with the story. We learn that the most important proof of our love for Jesus is our love for others. Look at the responses of Jesus to Peter. Three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Are you even my friend? And the response of Peter, of course I love you. Of course I love you. Yes, I do. In fact, I appeal to your omniscience because I don't trust my heart. But every time it was Peter saying, yes. And then the response of Jesus, look at his responses. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. What do I want to emphasize here? It's the personal pronoun. Uh, you, you grammar experts, personal, possessive sense. My lambs, as a pastor, it just blows me away. You see, GCF. You are not my sheep. You are Christ's sheep. You are not the board of elders' sheep. You are Jesus' sheep. He gave his life for you. He is the only one who has the right to say, my sheep, my lambs. And that puts the terror of accountability into my heart. But it also, beloved, just reminds me that despite this awesome accountability, the Lord has entrusted his servants with the people he loves, and that's you. Every time Jesus said the same thing, Peter, love those that I love. Love them by feeding them like a shepherd. Love them by taking care of those new, the lambs, taking care of those older in the faith, the sheep. And beloved, every genuine Christian desires to reciprocate God's love. You know what? If you're going to ask God, but you don't need to, it's here in our Bible. Lord, how will you know I love you? He'll tell you exactly the same thing. Love those I love. And then I feel your love. I told you when we went to the book of Genesis, every single narrative in the whole Bible, Old Testament New, isn't primarily for moral lessons. Yes, there are. Yes, there are moral principles to learn and apply, but beloved, the primary purpose of the Bible narratives is not moral lessons. It's to teach us about God. It's to reveal Himself to us. We have a God who is the Logos, the great communicator. And even in this incident, He is teaching us about Himself. Lord, what are you teaching us about yourself? that he has a shepherd heart. Our God is a good shepherd, dear friends. It reveals much about him that the very last scene in the Gospel of John would highlight the shepherd heart of God, telling you and me, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Then love me, and I will feel that love when you shepherd those whom I love for me. Let's take care of Christ's sheep. Let's take care of each other, beloved. Because the most important proof of our love for Jesus is our love for others. But we also learn one more thing. The most important focus in our serving Jesus is to follow him, even if it costs us everything. Look at verse 18. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, when you were younger... You dressed yourself, went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you, lead you where you do not want to go. What is Jesus saying? He's prophesying 
He's telling Peter, Peter, this is how you will die. Like this. Did Peter understand what that meant? He did. Peter realized Jesus was telling him, you're going to be crucified. Now, I want you to understand this. What if I went to Elder Peter Young and said, Peter, we're good friends, right? Peter, I know how you're going to die. You're going to be crucified. Do you think he liked me? Probably not like me. Why are you doing this to me, pastor? I want you to know when Jesus did this to Peter, he's actually saying this. Peter, did I not tell you to love me? Did I not tell you to make me feel your love by loving others? Peter, I want to tell you this. You will be faithful. You will be successful. You will be so successful, Peter. You will be so faithful, you will die for me. And you know what the effect on Peter was? For the next 30 years of his life, he was set on fire. Knowing he would one day be crucified. Instead of being dismayed, he was like he was lit. And then from that day on, he was willing to die. The former coward, beloved, who denied his Lord not once but three times. Did he get it? He did. 2 Peter 1, 13 to 14. The last thing Peter ever wrote, probably a year or more before his death, he said, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this body because I know I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. This was 30 years or more after Jesus told him, you will be crucified. And he was looking forward to it. Please get this. What this reveals to us is that from beginning to end, Jesus believed in Peter more than Peter believed in himself. Jesus saw what Peter could become, and he told him, in case you doubt, you're going to be very faithful. You're going to be very successful to the point it will cost you your life. It inspired Peter. Beloved, In the Coast Guard of some countries, when someone is to be rescued at sea, the Coast Guard are told, you have to go. You don't have to come back. You know what that means? If there is someone at sea and you have the only life jacket, put it on him or her, even if it kills you. If the lifeboat is full and there is no more room for one, you jump over and make sure they're saved. Did you know that's our calling to? Every Christian, not just pastors, not just missionaries. God's call to us, especially, beloved, in the 20th and 21st centuries, is to do exactly the same. Jesus is telling us you have to go, but you don't have to come back. It is well said that the last hundred years, more Christians have died in the last hundred years than in the last 2,000 years after Jesus was crucified. The last hundred years have been the bloodiest in terms of martyrdom for Christianity. And this speaks a lot. Many Christians have heeded that call. You have to go. You don't have to come back. May God give us the grace to love Jesus so much that when he says, I'm calling you to do this, we will follow him, whatever the cost. We may be uncertain and fearful about the future, but if we know God is in control, we can confidently follow Christ no matter what the future holds, even if it is crucifixion. Jesus then repeated the very first command he had ever given Peter. He said, follow me. Uh, Why was this the first command? Because in Matthew 4.18, when Jesus saw Peter the first time, Together with Andrew, he told him, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. You know what this means? It's like a full recommissioning. It's like what we did to Parkin, but it's his first. It's like Jesus said to Peter, Peter, I want you to know you're fully in. You're in all the way. You are restored. You begin all over, Peter. Follow me. And that's what Jesus was saying. But beloved, we close with this final thought. 
in our following Jesus, the most important factor is to keep our eyes on him. Verse 20, it's implied there that uh, initially they were seated around a fire. But after that, apparently Jesus stood up and began to walk along the beach. And so Peter was following him. And that's what's happening. And as Peter was following behind Jesus, verse 20 implies that Peter looked back. And guess what? He saw John. Who's John? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is John? The one closest to Jesus. Who is John? Cousin. First cousin of Jesus. He was following Jesus behind Peter. And now Peter makes another mistake. Peter asked the Lord, Lord, what about him? You see, in the midst of Jesus' reinstatement, Peter makes yet another mistake. His curiosity about John makes him lose focus again. That's why I like Peter. He is just like me and you. He is so encouraging, isn't he? Now, I love the response of Jesus. Look at verse 22. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. You know, in contemporary language, I like it even better. You know what Jesus said? Peter, he is none of your business. That's what he said. Uh, stop looking at John. Uh, I told you to follow me. Now do it. You must follow me. You know, in the Greek, the imperative here is even stronger. The word must just captures it barely. You must follow me, Peter, and stop getting distracted. Brothers and sisters, we must never let our curiosity about God's call or God's work in others' lives distract us from our calling. You know what happens? If I look at others, if you look at others, we will do one of two things. We will deprecate them, you know, look down on them, or we'll do the opposite. We'll resort to hero worship. Did you know one of the early churches was almost destroyed by this? In 1 Corinthians 1 to 4, the early church, the, the church in Corinth, they began to form factions inside the church. Actually, it's a group of house churches. And each faction would, some would say, I'm for Peter. You know, one of the original 12. No, I'm for Apollos, the young pastor who's such a brilliant speaker. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm for Paul, you know, the apostles of the Gentiles. I remind you, we Corinthians are mostly Gentiles. Three factions, probably even four. And Paul spent four chapters rebuking them, correcting them. And beloved, that's not what God wants us to do. We cannot let the same mistakes happen in any church, but especially Green Hills Christian Fellowship. What am I trying to say? In this church, we do not look at anyone, especially the pastor. We practice Hebrews 12 too. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Sometimes we have rivalry and competition inside the church. Or it's sometimes church versus church. Uh, I'll give you an example. Do you remember the orchestra? Uh, they were not raptured, by the way. They'll come back. Remember them. <laughs> I hope I'm right. I hope they come back. Anyway, what if the violinist would go to the one with the French horn and say, Hey, you, in the middle of playing. Hey, you, you do your job well. Huh? You, you, you do a better job of playing the French horn. Or what, or what if the trumpeter goes to the pianist and says, in the middle of the orchestra. Yeah, you, you pianist, you're off key. Will you do a better job? What will happen? The whole orchestra is disrupted. It's not the job of the individual players to either criticize or condemn. It is their job just to do what they're good at. Whose job is it to conduct the orchestra? The conductor. In Christ's church, Christ is the head. We do not look at others to condemn them or criticize them or compare ourselves to them. We do that also church-wide. I know some of you keep telling me our members are getting poached or proselyted. Beloved, we will not resort to that. I know it's being done to us, but we will not do that to any church. I'm just praying we'll do a better job so that our members do not get poached or proselyted because we do not believe in competition within the church or with other churches. And I believe that's what God wants, beloved. We don't compete. We don't criticize. We play our part. 
That's what we learn in this portion of the passage. Now look at verse 23. Because of the statement of Jesus, the rumor spread that John would not die. You know what Jesus actually said? He was actually prophesying that John would not die until he sees the return of Jesus. Tradition tells us that Peter was martyred, crucified upside down in AD 68 by the emperor Nero. Why upside down? Because he said, please do not crucify me like my Lord. I am not worthy. So they crucified him upside down at his request. It was not the same for John. Tradition also tells us there were two murder attempts on his life. The first was a cup of poison. But to the surprise of his would-be murderers who hated him for being an evangelist, he just drank the poison and nothing happened. The second time was they prepared a huge vat of boiling oil. Again, this is tradition. It's not in your Bible. They bound him hand and foot and then threw him into the vat of boiling oil. Well, it is said that the oil loosened his bonds. He just climbed out of the vat, you know, and brushed off the oil, walked away as if nothing happened. And so the emperor finally decided, we cannot kill this guy. Let's just exile him to Patmos. And the emperor didn't realize that exactly what God wanted to happen. Because at Patmos, you know the story. God would reveal to John the return of Jesus Christ, which is now captured in the book of Revelation. And it is said that after he had written the book of Revelation, not so long after that, at the age of 99 or 100, John died of old age. A different calling from Peter. But that's what Jesus prophesied. Beloved, this just tells me you are immortal until God says it's time for you to go. Uh, so you, your home could be sitting on the West Valley Fault and the big earthquake can happen. But if God says, no, it's not your time, I promise you, you'll be alive. <laughs> but if God says it's your time, you could be sitting in a building and a jet plane could fall on you from nowhere. Get what I'm saying, beloved? Make sure you are ready to meet the Lord. But until then, as a Christian, you're immortal until God says it's time to come home. I want to close with these thoughts. In verse 24, Jesus identified himself but refused. I mean, sorry, John. John identified himself but refused to focus. You know what he was focusing on? He said, you know what? I cannot even give proper honor. It's not enough. Everything I've written is not enough to honor the Lord, who is not just the risen Lord, not just the incarnate Word, but the one who created the universe. In fact, he says in verse 25, if we captured everything he did, the world is not enough to capture as a library. And I was thinking, really? Uh, what if uh, John wrote in uh, 2018, do you think the cloud can capture? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think anything can capture what the Lord Jesus has done. So as we close, beloved, the real hero of Peter's story isn't Peter. The real hero here is Jesus. That's why John 21 is in the Bible. So that all of us Peter types would know that though we fall again and again, by God's grace we can keep getting back up. Because no matter how far you fall, God gives repentant Christians a second chance. And the only thing he looks for is genuine love for him. The son who is the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, now calls each of us to shepherd on his behalf all those he loves. You who are serving the Lord, thank God. Keep serving. You have not started, but you want to. What is keeping you? Serve the Lord. Love those he loves. But Peter, if you're out there, and you keep moaning and groaning and saying, if only God will take me back, it's time to stop and simply come back. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because your grace is always greater than our sins. Your faithfulness greater than our failures. 
And Lord, your plan for us is greater than even our worst mistakes. And Lord, that no matter what happens in our lives, Lord, because Christians will still fail and fall in this life. We know if we return to you with all our hearts, with a repentant heart, Lord, you will always call us back to serve you again. And so, Lord, may the Lord's table remind us of your grace. Make us grateful people willing to serve you out of love, out of the right heart. Beloved, I'll give you a moment to just examine your heart before the Lord. If God is revealing something to your heart that makes you uncomfortable about taking the communion today, why don't you settle this before the Lord? Why don't you spend a minute, I'll give you a minute of personal silent prayer, just to settle anything that God is revealing to your heart before we proceed with the communion. Let's have a minute of personal prayer. Father, we thank you that anyone who comes to you, Lord, always goes by the same route, only by grace. We thank you that we can never earn our forgiveness. That means, Lord, when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just because your grace is always greater than even our worst mistakes. We thank you, Lord, that small sin, big sin, private sin, public, shameful sin. All of them are covered by your grace. So let everyone who came to you with a broken heart and a humble heart find forgiveness, assurance, and a reminder that your love will never fail. Do that for us today, we pray to the Lord's table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beloved, it is my great pleasure before we proceed with the communion to do something that always is a special joy to me. I'm going to ask to stand and face you, the newest members of the GCF family. Will you please stand, our newest members? Turn around and face our uh, congregation. Praise God. Over here also. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So, uh, everyone, I hope you find the growth group and the ministry, and I hope that you'll get on the ministry and hit the ground running. Praise the Lord. I have the joy, you may be seated, I have the joy of serving you communion, so please uh, don't compete with me, anybody, <laughs> among our friends here. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, would take some usually ordinary things. Give the meaning by saying, whenever you do this, be reminded of what it cost you to be saved. So, beloved, you will receive bread. May it remind you of how expensive it was to save us. The broken body of Christ, please receive it. <laughs>
the Lord Jesus the night he was betrayed. He would take the bread, break it, give it away, telling his disciples, as he is telling you now. This is my body, which is for you. You do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus would take the fruit of the vine. Beloved, this is the reminder that the blood of Christ was shed for our sins. Please receive it. of you who know you stand forgiven at the cross like the choir sang will you stand with me right now and as we raise the cup will you please say this with me from your heart I honor my Savior who died for my sins I honor my Savior who died for my sins Allow me to close this time with a word of prayer after which the choir will bless you with a benediction in song. You may drop the cups on the way out the door. Father, enable us as a people to always be reminded through the Lord's table we have been forgiven much. And Lord, when it gets old to us, when we forget, Lord, remind us again and again. 
we have been forgiven much. And so we must love much. And so we must forgive even the unforgivable. Because you forgave us when we were unforgivable. And Lord, remind us that your love does not end. It goes on until this moment. It will be with us in the future. It will be with us through eternity. And let every time we do this, Lord, and let every time we just come before you, even alone as people, let it always be a time that we'll be reminded you loved us first. And the rest of our life is simply a grateful response of love. Obeying the word, a joyful pleasure because of your love. Serving you a joyful undertaking because of your love. May this be your blessing upon your people. And all of this we ask in the name of the one who died on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen.